But God's been all over me about faith in the last two weeks. And I, I don't think I've preached on faith, I, I can't remember how many years. I mean, it's sort of the thing you do back there. You don't, you know, we're getting into heavier stuff. Yeah. But the Lord's told me, no, you revisit faith. Because we have to live by faith, and it's by faith that we please Him. Yes. And we're going to have to live more and more by faith. Oh, you know, I think of that scripture, yeah. um, it says, great fear is going to come upon the yes. earth. Yeah. Well, the only way to overcome fear is faith. Yeah. Faith in God's yeah. Word. It's yeah. the only way. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just going to share some thoughts on that this morning. Um, yeah, if I stand on your toes, don't stone me. I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it intentionally. It's for me also. <laughs> you know, Proverbs 13, 12 says, Hope deferred or hope delayed makes the heart grow sick. Huh? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I think that sort of speaking to all of us. When we lose hope, uh, and all of us go through this at times, it hits each, other, each one of us, doesn't it? Loss of hope hits each one of us at some point in our lives. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. And um, that feeling of betrayal, maybe by someone, or, or loss of a loved one, or a loss of maybe an expectation, uh, it, it can impact us greatly. And it has the capacity to destroy families. It has the capacity to destroy friendships. Loss of hope. And it, it, it can cause us to want to give up on what we're doing, it can cause us to want to give up on our relationships, on our relationship with the Lord even at times. I've been there. I've been there where I have walked away from the Lord because of a loss of hope. And, you know, I'll be honest with you. I, I'm not one of these people who stand here and make out of, I'm perfect. I've been in that place where I just lose so much hope. I get so discouraged. Mm -hmm. I, I go through the motions of my Christianity but I'm no longer in relationship. And um, and looking at the life of Joseph, he's been on my heart also this week. Mm. Joseph, the great preparer for what was coming. And I think that's relevant to us. Prepare for what's coming. And looking at his life, we see a young man full of hope. 17 years old. He's got no reason to not hope. He's got a bunch of dysfunctional brothers. <laughs> But he's in a good family. I mean, plenty of money, no, no real issues going down there. He has dreams from God, this young boy. And he's got all the hope in the world. And yet, look what happens to his life. And, and I'm not going to preach on that, but we all know the story, you know, how he's betrayed by his family, his brothers. And, and, and it doesn't stop there. It gets worse. And you think, where is God in this? You know, I'm sure he's saying that. Where is God in this mess? You know, now he's in prison and, and it's like everything looks bad. And But I thought you were going to do this for me, God, because you gave me this dream. And yet, look at the condition I'm in now. Look at what's going on. I don't know if you felt like that, but I often come to that place. And I think as a group, we've probably gone through this transition period where God has been developing us. And we think, what's next? And when, God? When's it going to happen? You know, And it's like we're there sitting on the horse, waiting for the gate to open. And, and I just want to encourage you, don't lose hope. Amen. Don't lose hope Amen. because we are in a season where God is in control. Amen. And um, what are you currently facing that's shaking your life? The word shaking come to me. That was the first word for this message I wrote down a week ago, shaking God is shaking the nations. He's shaking our lives. He's shaking the lives of people. Why? Because he is trying to refine his church. And um, someone says, no, God is not refining me, but the devil is attacking me. And I want to put it to that person that God allows these things mm -hmm. to happen for a reason. Be it God shaking us or the devil it's irrelevant, you are more than a conqueror. We don't have to cow down to that. We don't have to lose hope. But we have all lost hope at times, let's be honest. Yeah. And someone, you know, each each one of us, I believe, are still in a refining process. I include myself in that. I don't think we ever leave it until we reach heaven. 
we are being refined like gold, pure. Mm -hmm. And um, if we follow the news, we'd see in the last week there's been a lot of shaking. There's a lot of shaking happening and there's a lot of resistance happening in the world. Mm -hmm. God is shaking the nations. There is no doubt about that. Interesting, New Zealand was the mm -hmm. first place God shook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting what's happening at the moment, and navigating the months ahead for us will require absolute faith, F-A-I-T-H. And that's really what I want to talk about today, this issue of faith, uh, because great reward is going to come from your faith, from my faith. And it takes great faith to live life on this earth, but it's going to take even greater faith in the hours to come, to live a godly life. And my question to myself is, if I can't live by faith now, I am not going to be able to live by faith soon. <laughs> we need to know that we're living in a place of faith now, that we trust God, not ourselves. And um, in Luke 18, verse 8, Jesus makes a comment. He says, this verse we all know, when I return, will I find faith? And if you back up a chapter or so before, the talk is about the kingdom, and that's what this mm -hmm. verse is relating to. And really, I could paraphrase that word correctly, is when I return, will I find faithfulness? Mm -hmm. Because that's what faith is. You can't separate one from the other. Faith and faithfulness are joined at the hip, if you like. Mm -hmm. And we see the same word... Um, I'll back up on that. When I return, will I find faith? And I just want to make a comment here. For those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, the theology is that this verse is relating to that, that God is going to take the church out and then there's going to be a bunch of no hope is left. There's going to be no faith. That's basically, excuse me for making it simple, but that's, that's what the belief is. Well, that's not scriptural. That's not what Jesus is referring to here at all. This is not about whether you believe in God and in Jesus Christ as his son. That's not what he's talking about. It's will you be faithful when I come back? In other words, have you been faithful to me, to my word, to my father? That's what he's talking about. This is not about salvation. And again, we see Jesus use the same meaning exactly in Revelation 2. Chapter 2, verse 10, where he says, Be thou faithful, even unto death, and then I'll give you the crown of life. It's exactly the same meaning. And when Paul Thank was you. talking of the second coming of Christ, and we know that his discourse in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, That day will not come unless there come a falling away first. The son of perdition shall be revealed. In other words, Jesus is not coming back until there is a great falling away. Now, we all know that. Falling away from faith, or falling away from those who should be found faithful but are not faithful. That's what he's referring to. And the root word for the word faith in Hebrew is the word emuna, E-M-U-N-A-H, and it means to trust more than anything else. In other words, our... our we trust the word of God above everything. I know we're going back to the foundations of our faith, and, and you might think, well, this is really simple, but I think we need to be reminded of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's this faith or faithfulness that comes only from total submission of our lives to the word of God. And speaking to the centurion, Jesus has this conversation with him, and he says, never have I found such faith, mm -hmm. such Faithfulness. Why? What did Jesus see in this guy? This guy didn't really know a great deal about Jesus. We know that. We, we know that he wasn't a practicing believer per se. But Jesus could see something in him. And what it was this, that this guy understood authority. And because he understood authority, he applied that and used faith with it. His authority was in, his, his mindset was, I am a man under 
authority. I hear the word do this and do that and I do it. And that's his mind. That's all we need to know really. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we get so religious and so caught up in mm -hmm. needing to know everything in the Bible. All we need to know is if God said it, that settles it. That's simple. <laughs> it's that simple. We need to simplify this thing out a little bit. And and so never have I seen such great faith. Jesus said that. Imagine that. The guy doesn't even know his Bible. Yeah. Never have I seen such great faith. Sometimes we think we've got to go through Bible school to get great faith. And yet this guy hadn't even heard the gospel. And Jesus said, never have I seen such great faith. <clears throat> Why? Because he understood authority. And we need to understand authority. If God said it, settles it. And that's my attitude to life. People have called me reckless in my faith. But that's my attitude. God said it. That's the end of it. So when I'm going for God, I am 100% God. I cannot live any other way for God. I backslide if I go the other way because I can't. I, it, it's either it's true or it's not true to me. It's that simple. So I live with that simplicity. I don't question it. And I think, you know, this whole thing of submission to God's word being the final authority is what the church needs to grasp in this hour. He only needed to know, I will obey what my commander in chief tells me. That's all he needed to know. And he did. We all have faith, but what do we have faith in? Yes. <laughs> Our sister said, someone said this morning, we've all been given a measure of faith. That's true. We all start out with the same. All of us. You know, I, I've observed in my life those that I can relate to the most are the little children that we preach to in the squatty areas and those places. This simplistic faith. Mm. They don't even know him. They don't know, they don't even have a Bible. Most of them have never sat under a service. They don't know a biblical song. Mm. Nothing. And yet you tell them and they grab it. Their life is so damaged. They're looking for something to put hope into. And there's something special about working with those people. I thank God for this group because that's where the heart of this group is, for the broken, those in need, the downtrodden, the widows, the orphans. That's where the heart of God is too. So where is our faith? What is it in? Is it in God's word? Or are we still on the throne in some area? Faith is everything. Everything. We cannot lessen it. For it's your faith that's your most valuable commodity. It's your faith that Jesus said will move the mountain. It's our faith that will move God. And that's the most important thing. <clears throat> it's our faith that touches him. Think about that. If you want to get into intimacy... Start stretching your faith. Stretch it beyond your comfort zone. Stretch it outside of your brain because that's what touches God, that faith. Two seven, 217 is a year of transition and a year of shaking. And for the transition to come, the shaking has to happen. For us to get across the river, the river's got to part. So God is going to shake it. And both of these are purposed by God to move us from the old to the new. So we're moving from the old to the new. And there's always a price to pay when you have something new. It's quite interesting. This week we've spent a lot of the week throwing out stuff. Stuff that we've worked for and, and sacrificed our life to earn. And now it's become accumulation because you do accumulate in life. And we're throwing out that which we've sacrificed for. And it seems quite bizarre, but that's life. We go through life, we work, we accumulate, but we can't take none of it with us. You know, so that some of these very wealthy men in, in your country, brother, the, the, you know, the, their whole life, they just spend their whole life buried and trying to get resources and money. Trying to change the world with their money. But when they get in that cask, that coffin, they're no different than you or me. They can't take one cent with them. Where is our priorities in life? 
No matter what the situation you're facing or me, we must realize God has allowed it. We don't always know why. I know it's difficult, you know, when I when I lost a loved one. I know I know the feeling of that, that 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 shell, that the emptiness, that that deep loss that you think I can't do anything about this outside of my control. Where are you, God, in this? But God allows these circumstances, these situations. He knows all about it. He allows it for whatever reason, and he knows. But we've got to look beyond that. We've got to look beyond it. A, la a lady was carried into my church. I don't speak thrivishly what I'm just saying either because I've lost loved ones, but I've been among this so often now. Where I'll give you an example. A lady is carried into a church I had planted. And I mean carried by two men. And they brought her straight up the front and I was preaching. And I may have told this story before, but it's worth repeating. And... I stopped the service and I asked her what I could do for her. I thought they had brought her in for prayer because she was crippled. And she said, I need to talk to you. And I said, sit down and I'll talk to you after the meeting. And I did. And she told me, she said, the doctors have told me that I haven't got long. And I want you to have my children behind her as two boys. Now, that's hard. You imagine if it's your children. This woman is much younger than any of us in this room except her children. She's a younger woman in her mid-40s probably. And she said it with such conviction and no emotion in her face. She had come to a place of accepting and I said to her, in my foolishness, I said, look, you know, I've got faith and I'll pray for you. <laughs> and um, I did. I'll pray for a miracle, but, you know, she had heard from God and I hadn't. And she was right and she died two weeks later. And I'll never forget that. Because then we have two very small children who we're telling about the love of God to them. But this God that we're telling about is love has taken their mother in their mind. You try and work that one out. It's not easy. So I've been a and that's only one of many cases like this. And I often think about her, the great faith this woman had. She knew what she needed to do, and she did it with love and conviction. And the saying, you don't know what you have until you lose it, becomes a reality at these times, doesn't it? You know, our true, our true faith is tested at these times. And possibly the greatest teachers of faith on my view as children. I really believe that. Children that love the Lord, I think are the greatest teachers of faith that I've ever seen. I've heard message after message on faith, but I've never seen faith greater than a child. And Jesus said, let the little children come to me. He understood that, for theirs is the kingdom. Heaven belongs to them. And a valuable key I learned working with children was to teach them this one thing. Worship the God of heaven because he loves you. And worship Jesus because he died on the cross for you. And that's what we do with every child that we've ever taken. <clears throat> that's a lot of children now. That is the only thing that we try and impress on them. And the reason is because I explained to them, we love you and we will do everything we can for you. We will never replace mum or dad, but we will do the best we can do for you. And the others here love you too. But there'll be times <coughs> that you'll feel sad and you'll feel lonely and you'll have memories. And the only thing you can do with those is to take them to the one who loves you the most. That's the most valuable lesson you can teach a child. Through worship, I've seen this, Psalm 34, 18, the Lord drew us near to the brokenhearted. I've seen it so often <coughs> with these children that come in so messed up. 
Absolutely. I could tell you stories that would make you want to cry, vomit. Yes. And yet, I have seen these children transformed. This is not some fancy preaching message. I have seen the transformation with my eyes. I've watched it. Because we don't have the answers to these children's lives. You can say they need psychiatrists and psychologists. No, none of that will help when you've lost your mother and now you're in this situation. None of that is going to help. The only one that can help in this situation is an intervention from God Almighty. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've seen so many times. Their weakness becomes their strength. And I guess the same case studies could be said for some of the adults we've worked with too, because there's been some tragic cases. So what is the answer? What is the answer to life's issues? Why do so many today have to continue in counselling? So many. I've got some loved ones in this situation. Never seeming to get free of their troubles. Why do adults go to their grave with insecurities? They may be rich, but they're insecure. Why do some who come for help leave never returning because they take offense of the truth of God's word? Why do so many use drugs or alcohol, pornography or whatever, and cannot overcome these strongholds? These are good people. Some of these people are good people. Some of these people have given their hearts to the Lord, but their hearts are so bound and their minds are so bound with these things. All issues of life have the same answer. Faith in God's word. It's, it's so simple, it becomes so profound. It becomes so difficult because we try and analyze it. It's so simple. Faith in God's word will set the captive free. And I've seen it with children. I, we, I was talking to a brother this morning. We've got one girl there that doesn't want to leave the orphanage. The reason she doesn't want to leave is because she knows her past. She's, she's come from a tragic past, and, and this is wonderful life now. But she's come from that mess, a messed up back. I, mean, I shouldn't say it because I don't want people to hear it on the... Just a messed up upbringing. And yet, this girl is holding a degree. She is bright. She's a top student in a class at university. She's... You've got to say, how? I mean, if you talk to psychologists, they wouldn't be able to give you the answer, how? It's God. It's, it's faith. It's, it's, it's sim simple faith. Just staring people into trusting God's word and exchanging their doubts for his word. See, to trust God, to trust in God, and to have faith are the same. They're, they're the one and the same. And all issues of life have the same answer. Faith in God's word. Yet so many would say, I've tried that and it didn't work. Oh, I've heard it. You've probably heard that. In Genesis 3, we get the story, the first story of man. God's intervention into man's fall. And God prepares a sacrifice to cover man's sin in that time and God himself offers the sacrificial offering that clothes man and allows him access to God again for without that Adam could not have had access back to God again and the only way Adam could access God's presence again and worship him was through an acceptable offering and I want to emphasize that word acceptable there are offerings that are unacceptable to God there's a lot of offerings that are unacceptable to God. So the key word is acceptable. An example of that would be someone who's in a position like mine, who's not living according to the biblical standards of what you're meant to be doing. That is not an acceptable offering to God. He said, but Lord, I did this in your name. I did that in your name. He said, depart from. It's not acceptable to go through the motions and to do the stuff if our offering is not acceptable in a sight. You know, and, and I could go on many, many different 
stories here, but our offering's mm. got to be acceptable. Has to be acceptable to God. We cannot appropriate the sacrifice that Jesus made, nor the benefits if my offering is not acceptable mm. to God. Some yeah. people think that they can receive the benefits of His sacrifice, but their offering to God, it doesn't matter. Well, that's wrong thinking because our offering to God matters. And each of us have different areas of our life that we have to address. There's different areas with each of us. For the rich man, his struggles is his trust in his money. Yes. For, for someone else, it's something else. For, for someone who's poor, for example, their struggle is their poverty because they still need to give to God. They still need to sacrifice to God. And so they rationalize just as the rich man would rationalize. So our sacrifice, our offering to God has to be acceptable. So firstly, Adam, the offering had to be acceptable by Adam as he needed to accept what God had done for him. In other words, if he had not have accepted the offering, it would be no good for him. You say that's really basic. Yeah, but there's a lot of Christians have not accepted what Jesus has done for them. The act of putting on that garment in Genesis 3, that God had given an offering, a sacrifice, so Adam now is acceptable once again to God. In Genesis 4, we see two brothers, Cain and Abel. And you see this struggle going on in the minds of one of these boys that's caused the problems that we've got, many of them today in the world. Both of them give God an offering. One gives him an offering of whatever, his crops or whatever it was out of the ground. The other one knows what God requires. God requires a blood offering an acceptable offering. One is willing to give what he's willing to give because he did it his way. The other's willing to give what God requires. There is a big difference. There's a huge difference. God did not respect Cain and his offering, the Bible says, and Cain was very angry. And it's amazing that people can get so upset and angry when they feel rejected, when they feel upset that you've said something to them. For example, when you tell them God does not accept their singing songs in the church as a worship leader, mm -hmm. whilst in the public their mouth is full of poison and nastiness. Mm -hmm. You know, we can go through the motions, but is this acceptable to God? And by faith, Abel offered up a more excellent sacrifice, the Bible said, than Cain, which tells us he was a worshipper. What is a true worshipper? One that offers an acceptable sacrifice. That's what true worship is. It's not about the music. It's what's acceptable to God. Am I offering him what's acceptable? So what does it mean to worship by faith? Because so many worship by their feelings when they feel like it. Do I feel like worshiping today? I'm just not in the mood to sing. I'm just not, you know... Just let the others do. Hey, I've been there. Come on. You, you know, it's true. That's not acceptable to God. Worship is submission of my will to his. And I've watched these children. Actually, we've got videos online. I, I must show them one day. Where children are worshipping God and the adults are falling down under the power of God through the child's worship. We've got videos online of this. This is not make-believe. This is concrete floors. No carpet here. <laughs> huh? The presence of God is so powerful, so strong. Why? Because their worship is acceptable to God. Mm -hmm. A true disciple is one who puts God's will above their own, even when they don't feel like it. And as Jesus said, not my will. But yours be done. We know all this stuff, I know. And you're saying this is really basic. Yep, it is. But remember the words of Jesus, not my will. 
that yours be done. The early church was known for its faith, so what do people know me for? What do they know you for? In the, in the community, in our workplace, in our home, in the prison, what are we known for? In our schools, more importantly in our family, what are we known for? Some people are known for their doubt, their anger, their tempers, whatever. Some for their wealth and some for their poverty. But are we truly known as a person of faith? I think that's the highest accolade you can have on your grace, though. <laughs> he or she was a person of faith. They trusted God. Romans 12, verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has given to each one of us a measure of faith. God has given to each one of us a measure. What are we doing with it? What does this mean? What does it mean? to the children that lost their mother, they had the same amount of faith that you or I have got. God's given it to everyone. Isn't that wonderful? The only difference is what we choose to do with it. It's like a muscle. It's like my tummy needs to lose weight. <laughs> and, you know, it's because I'm lazy. <laughs> I need to do more exercise. It's like Maggie's got a better brain than me because she's used it and studied harder. No, well, there, I mean, you've got the paper to prove it, and yet the only difference is what we choose to do with what God has given us. Complaining about circumstances, life is a waste of time because God's just going to yawn at you. He's not going to listen. It doesn't change anything, but we need to rise above the situations that seem so hopeless and seeing through heaven's perspective. Amen. I don't know. You know, I've made life complicated because I try and rationalize God's word sometimes. I'm getting better at not doing it. But I've spent a lot of my life trying to work it out. And yet all he's asking is us. Even. But you don't understand my situation. <laughs> You've heard that before I have. I have one lady come to me, you don't understand what I'm going through. Yes. It's not like that. <laughs> I don't need to understand it. <clears throat> God understands it. Amen. He understands and he allows trials and tests. He allows it. Yes. Why? To draw us closer to him. Amen. There's no such thing as you have a special problem. You're not that special. You don't have a special problem. We've all got problems. Huh? My problem is different. You just don't <coughs> understand me. Many, many have said that, but it's not true. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. I love this verse. There is no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common. Common. <laughs> It's common. Your problem's common. You may think it's not. It's common. It's common to man, but God is faithful. Amen. That will not allow you to be tempted, tested, or tried beyond what you can right. manage. You say, but I just don't like the way he's pushing me. I don't want this to happen. God won't allow beyond what you can be tested. Give thanks with a grateful Amen. heart. Amen. Give thanks. When you're in those trials and tears, because they are for a reason. And then he goes on and he says, and with the temptation, he makes a way of escape. Praise Amen. God. <laughs> he makes a way of escape. There it is. Doesn't he? He makes a way. We're just going to hang on in there because there's a way of escape. And I've just got to find this tunnel. It's a bit dark, but I'm going to see it. There is a way of escape. There is hope at the end of this. We've just got to hang in there. And that's, that's what faith is, using your faith. God will make a way of escape. When the temptation comes, there is an escape. In other words, God always makes sure 
there's a door to Walter. <laughs> he hasn't shut us in the dark room. Praise God. The context of this passage of scripture is referring to unbelief. It's all about unbelief. It's about the Israelites when they're in the desert and they weren't pleasing God. They were not exercising their faith. And that's what it was all about. God had made a way for them. Mm -hmm. Instead of focusing on God's word, they focused on their problems. We can't please them without faith. That's all I want to do. When I stand before him, I just want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful. To me, that's everything. Well done, good and faithful. <clears throat> I don't care about the mansion. <laughs> Actually, I don't care if I get a tree hut. Huh? I'm happy with what he gives me. I just want to hear those words that please him because I'll know I've walked in faith. But without faith, I cannot please him. We've got to revisit this whole thing about faith because I know each one of you want to please him. Each one of us are getting older. This should be the priority of our life. <laughs> older in age. <laughs> and, you know, when we stand before him, you want to hear the same, well done. You used your faith. I allowed you 50, 60, 70, 80 years on that earth to use your faith. Well done. Or is he going to say, you can enter in, but... You didn't use your faith as much as you could have. We're all on a level playing field. There's no celebrities here. We have the same amount of faith. The only difference is, are we using it? That's the only difference. And I've worked amongst the most tragic, tragic circumstances. One day I'm going to tell you some of these stories. <laughs> tragic. Things that don't happen here. I have seen horrific things more than my wife, and she came out of that environment. Because there's places I went that I wouldn't allow the team to go. Because it would mentally traumatize you if you're not ready for it. And I've learned the most effective way of changing lives is to teach people to worship God. That's why in heaven, that's what happens there. That's why surrounding God's throne, they're worshiping Him all the time. Because it brings a presence, it creates an atmosphere. And the prerequisite to God accepting our worship always is to examine our hearts. Not just to go into church and sing songs, Examine our hearts. Worship with our confession of our sin is unacceptable. There's so much in life we do that is unacceptable because we haven't gone back to the Word and applied faith. And children that should have been in mental institutions and scarred for life are set free. And I think the simple greatest difference is they don't have the props we've got. So they have to use their faith more. They don't have the systems in place that we have. They just simply believe God's word. And all of us have had a past. All of us have a past. Some of us have a worse past than others. And those consequences are unique to you and to me. And those consequences we have to overcome by faith. Don't hold on to those consequences like a badge of honor. And you think, well, I wouldn't do that, but I could tell you many people who do. Friends of mine, they hold on to their past as a badge of honor. This is a year of recalibration. Recalibration. Our future is not determined by our past. Our future is determined by our faith. 
is determined on where I'm going and who I'm listening to. Why? Because faith cometh by hearing. What I'm saying is pretty well what each of you gave out in your testimonies. This is collected into a message form. Faith comes by hearing, so what are we listening to? We can determine the community of people that I hang out with will impact my thinking for good or for worse, or I will impact theirs. And um, one lady told me, you've got no idea. I'll never forget it. After a meeting I took, you've got no idea what I'm going through, what I have to live to, what she didn't realize, she was living the way she did because her mind was programmed by the people she mixed with. Sometimes we need to cut off the old in order to recalibrate for the new. The same goes birds of a feather. Huh? Flock together. And I, you know, faith is not a science. It defies logic. We talk about faith, it's, it's faithfulness to God's word. That's what it means. You know, trying to approach God with logic and ask why is as foolish as Job when he started to reason with God. And God put him in his place. I was telling Emmy this the other night. She said, well, Job was a righteous man. I said, yeah, God gave him a kick, though. He put Job in his place, you know. God said to him, where were you when I created this thing? Hey, I did it, not you. And you're trying to tell me? It sort of puts things in perspective, you know. No matter how tragic, Joe jo went through some bad stuff. But God said, hey, pull your head in. Where were you when I created this thing? Do you not think I can take care of you and your problems? <laughs> I think it's important to realize God has got it under control. In other words, who do you think you are? <laughs> Telling me my word is not sufficient. In Job 38, verse 2, he says, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Imagine if God said that to you. <laughs> who is this who darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Job's getting put in his place here. Now prepare yourself like a man. Or as Brother Bruce would say, get hard. <laughs> Sit up and get hard. I will question you, and you will answer me, God says. <laughs> I love it. God sort of turns the tables on the sympathy. <laughs> so no matter how bad it seems, you don't understand, or my life... We need, to, we need to understand God is bigger than that problem. God is giving Job a lesson in faith, and that's what Jesus said, unless you become like a little child, you will not enter the, the kingdom of God. I'm going to wrap this up. You know, our comfort can become our curse. That's right. I have made a principle in my life in the last probably 25 years not to get comfortable. When I'm feeling comfortable, I break my comfort zone on purpose. And it, it takes discipline. And I'm not telling you you have to do the same, but it's something that God has impressed on me. When I become too comfortable, I break that comfort. It's difficult. It takes discipline. Because it means that I then have to become uncomfortable and get refocused with my faith. It is our comfort that can lessen our faith. My faith is an instrument of exchange. and If I had $10 on me, some legal tender, and I want to buy some bacon and eggs, my favorite. And I hold on to the tender and I keep confessing, I'm going to have bacon and eggs. I'm going to have bacon and eggs, but I don't give you that tender to buy that. I don't have my bacon and eggs. I know it sounds simple. It is simple. But my hope in having a feed of bacon and eggs is not going to happen unless I exchange something for it. That's what faith is. It's an exchange. Romans 5, verse 1 and 2, 
therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace by which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And justified means to stand right with God. Mm -hmm. I can stand rightly in his presence. And what he's saying is, if I am not right, I am not in faith. If I'm not living right, I'm not in faith. And if I'm not in faith, I'm not pleasing God. That's why I thought we needed to come back to this. Because each one of us, our heart's desire is to please God. I know that. But sometimes we stray away thinking we know best. I want to be right with him. If I am not right with God, I am not in faith. The Bible says... My righteousness and yours is as filthy rags. Mm -hmm. So if my righteousness is nothing and your righteousness is nothing, <clears throat> then the only way we, become, we can become righteous is by mm -hmm. trading with God. Mm -hmm. God's into trading. I think that's why he put Donald Trump there, because Trump is a trader. <laughs> God's into trading, exchanging. Mm -hmm. Your rubbish for his beauty. Yeah. <laughs> 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 The currency we trade with is faith. And faith in his word and not our circumstances. Faith in his word and not what's coming upon the earth. And do we believe what the Bible tells us? Because that's faith. Whatever our mountain is, tell it to get out of the way. you got a mountain today, tell it to get out of the way. Exercise your faith. What are you speaking? What am I speaking? Death and life are in the power of our tongues, the Bible says. And God favored Abel's sacrifice over Cain because it was an expression of his faith. What is the expression of your faith to God? It's not about what we do here. It's about what we do in that secret place. What is the expression of your faith to God? Your sacrifice is an expression of your faith. And wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. See, we've applied it to money, but it's not only about money. Wherever your treasure is, <coughs> this means wherever we invest ourselves, our time, our energy, mm -hmm. our focus. People support what they love. Why was Cain angry? Why? Was Cain so angry when Cain knew the sacrifice that God required? He knew it. Abel knew it. But see, like so many, they want God to accept their sacrifice the way they want to give it, rather than the way God wants to accept it. Sure. Abel's offering was by faith, and Cain's was through unbelief. And how, how often are we giving God? our offering out of unbelief. The reason with contention in the church is a reason is based on preference rather than on what he requires. All God required of Cain was to slay a lamb, but instead he slays his brother. That's all God wanted from him. How many people in the church of the living God are doing the same? Slaying each other with their words, with their preferences. When God said, all I want is an acceptable offering. How many relationships are ruined because of this? Because they won't offer to God what he asks. And all he asks is to have faith in his word. Just, just believe what I'm asking. I, I love you so much. Just believe. Just believe that. Just trust that. Don't trust what's happening to you. Don't trust the circumstances. Don't trust what the naysayers and the doubters are telling you. Trust my word. 
then all we need to do, you and me, is to throw our own beliefs on to the Lamb, because the Lamb is sufficient. It's enough. We don't have to try and work things out. It's already been worked out. And so, of course, Cain gets put into exile from that point on, and God isn't no respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of principles. God respects his principles. He doesn't respect people. And let faith arise in this season. Amen? Amen. We are in the season of transition. There's a shaking happening. Let your faith rise up. Amen. There is going to be a cost. That cost is going to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Allow God to shape your discomfort mm -hmm. until there's no more discomfort left in your life. Because he's trying to make us fit for the Master's use. He's trying to make us fit for the coming of our Lord and Saviour. None of us have obtained yet, and if we think we have, we're in pride. Each one of us are on a journey. I want to encourage you, allow him to shake you, no matter how severe it may seem. Allow him to change old belief patterns, because it's for your good. Everything he does is for our good. Father, we thank you for your word, the simplicity of this word. Lord, that we do need to be reminded that without faith we can't please you. Amen. The journeys of our lives are all heading to the same place, which is to stand before you one day and to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Lord, that's the desire of my heart that each one of us to hear those words. And Lord, that nothing on this earth will be able to keep those words from us. Help our faith to increase, Lord, by doing what's necessary to stop the hindrance and the doubt and unbelief in our lives. Our hope is in you and you alone. For without you, we are nothing, and we have nothing. Lord, we purpose to walk in truth. We purpose to walk in faith. And from this day forward, Father, we commit this to you. We commit this fresh week ahead, Lord. We thank you we're alive in this hour. What a great season to be alive. What a pleasure and an honor. Lord, use us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you.